Welcome everyone. My name is Charlene Margo and I am the founder of the Parent Education Series, co-founder of our new nonprofit organization, The Parent Venture. We could not be more delighted to see you all today, albeit on a screen. We'll be talking a lot about screens today. So again, it's a very important topic. We had a great response to this webinar and we want to say a special thank you to the Redwood City School District, the sponsors of this event. This is our inaugural presentation for the 2020-2021 season. So again, um, more than 250 of you registered for today, so we know that this is a topic, a topic that is high on everyone's list, especially with distance learning. We are very grateful to Dr. Devorah Heitner today, the founder of Raising Digital Natives. I'll be telling you a little bit about her in a moment, but um, Devorah is actually in Evanston, Illinois, so this is one of the silver linings of the pandemic that we're able to bring you such a top notch presenter from somewhere else in the country. So thank you, Devorah. Uh, again, <laughs> special, special thank yous again to the Redwood City School District for its sponsorship, the Sequoia Union High School District, the Sequoia Healthcare District, and the nonprofit, The Parent Venture. Today's format, for any of you who are new to Zoom, and I can't imagine that's too many of you, at the bottom of your screen, you will see a series of control buttons. We are offering simultaneous Spanish interpretation today. So if you need Spanish, please click on the globe icon and then click on the Spanish globe. You will see Cynthia Hinestrosa is going to be doing simultaneous Spanish. We will be talking in English. She will be talking in Spanish. So again, if you need that, do please click on the globe and then Spanish. Um, let's see, what else can I tell you? We are going to start with about 30 minutes of content, 30, 35 minutes of content with Dr. Heitner, followed by about 15 minutes of Q&A. If you have questions, and I'm sure that you will, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Feel free to check the chat for links and talk to each other, talk to us, but we would like the questions to go in the Q&A box. Um, and please, if you can, make those questions general and as brief as possible so that we can get to as many of your questions as we can today. And lastly, there will be a very short survey that we hope you will fill out. We will put that link in the chat box as well. And this event is being video recorded for any of you who have partners, spouses, kids, friends, neighbors who would like to listen. It will be available on our video library. All right, let me tell you a little bit about today's presenter. Dr. Devorah Heitner is an expert on young people's relationship with digital media and technology. Dr. Heitner is the author of ScreenWise, Helping Kids Thrive and Survive in Their Digital World, and she is the founder of Raising Digital Natives. Her mission is to cultivate a culture of empathy and social emotional literacy. Dr. Heitner's work has appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, Time Magazine, and Education Week. Dr. Heitner holds a PhD in Media Technology and Society from Northeastern, Northwestern University and has taught at DePaul and Northwestern. She is delighted to be raising her own digital native. So welcome, Dr. Heitner, and take it away. Thank you so much. I know this is an incredibly challenging time for families and uh, for many of us, probably the most challenging time in the history of our parenting. And, uh, it, it, and if, if it's not, then I feel for you even more because it, this, is, this is a heavy lift. And it's really hard too because human beings love certainty and planning and we haven't been able to know when it will end. Uh, that predictability that we count on to be, I'm, I'm a huge planner. I love to be able to plan my next month, my next year. A lot of us look forward to things that we plan with our families and it's how we can get through the difficult times. And a lot of us are having a hard time knowing a lot of things, right? Like when we'll be able to travel to see extended family, when, when it will be safe to return to in-person school for many of us. I know a few folks may be in-person school some days, but most of you are probably have your kids learning at home. And school itself is more than just a learning space for our kids. It's a social space. It's a community space. It's a space of all kinds of support uh, for our families. And so not having that is, is in the way that we're used to is a real challenge. So I want to talk about how we can make learning from home less challenging. I'm not going to say it's going to be easy, but I can say there's some strategies that will make it less challenging that will help your kids also find it less stressful 
and help you as you attempt to work from home and balance working uh, or going into work, because I know some of you are probably tr going to work and leaving the home to work, and how, how to balance that with having kids at home and not ha having that external structure that an in-person school day provides for so many of us, and also not having a lot of the other external structures that a lot of us depend on and, and count on, like kids sports and other activities in the community. I know a lot of that has changed as well. So I'm gonna share this with you. And right now you should be seeing a slide. Let's see, okay. And you can also tweet at me at Devorah Heitner and I'll share a way that you can hop on my mailing list if you want. So a lot of us would love for remote school to look like this, you know, a very sort of sanguine, happy kid, looking at the screen, engaged, doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing. Um, you know, with really engaging material and ideally your kid wouldn't be very loud because you're maybe trying to work in the next room or maybe there are siblings working in the same room. Uh, but the reality is that we're all on top of one another. I'm in a very small apartment with my family, a place I probably wouldn't have chosen if I had thought we would all be home in, for an indefinite period of time. Uh, but there we are, right? And many of us are familiar at this point with playing room roulette or, you know, uh, musical chairs, right, trying to move to find the best Wi-Fi, the quietest spot, and moving around as family members' needs and activities dictate throughout the day. Being this on top of one another is a, a real challenge too. So one of the things we can do is plan the days as much as possible. Uh, if you have a co-parent or any caregivers coming into your home, you know, plan the day with them. Where are different things going to happen? Who's going to be in charge uh, of different transitions throughout your child's day? If you're, if you're doing this on your own, that's really challenging. So I wanna just say like big ups to folks who are doing this on their own and don't have a co-parent present either because you are you don't have a co-parent or because you don't have a co-parent who's physically present throughout the day. That is challenging, but the good thing is you won't forget whose turn it is to do anything, right? It's really important that if you feel comfortable, uh, depending on your situation, that you are frank with your child's teacher about what's possible and impossible. So for example, I talked to a woman a few times in the last few months who's a single parent who has a job where it's almost impossible for her to help her son make transitions between certain times of day because that's her heaviest time at work. So she has, and her son has a 504 at school, so has some special needs and is getting some special services. So she let them know these are the times when I'm the least available and there is no co-parent, it is just me and my kid. And the school really worked with her her son is a middle schooler, so he's taking charge of some of those transitions himself. And the school is also working with her to make sure that the most, the, the times where she's needed the most are times where it's possible for her to connect. So one thing we can do is now that we've had weeks to observe how is remote school going, let teachers know uh, what exactly what's going on with you. And if there are consistent trouble spots throughout the day, like we know that I always have something at 10 a.m. for work and my kid is always getting you know, in trouble because they're missing their 10 a.m. meeting. What can we do? Is there a possibility that the teacher could open that room a little early? Maybe your child could be hanging out there from 9.50. Uh, I know a lot of teachers uh, and districts wisely structure things so kids aren't just sort of unsupervised in Google Meets and Zooms all day. Uh, but if they know that your child needs to come in early, otherwise they might miss that transition completely, maybe they can accommodate that. Maybe there's a way that your child can meet that need uh, asynchronously outside of the specific time that it's happening as well. So the more we communicate that with school, the more they may be able to meet us where we are. Uh, that said, this is you know a, a real heavy lift for teachers too. And I think we always wanna reach out to teachers and administrators right now with just so much assumption of goodwill that they are trying, that they may have their own kids learning from home as well and that it's a really stressful time for everyone. So we never wanna kind of go to them, you know, in a, in a negative way, but, but in a collaborative spirit, I know they will try to help you because they, they want your kid to have the best experience. They want their students to be learning. So this moment of contextual collapse that happened before the pandemic, I love to refer back to it when this man is speaking as an expert on the BBC News and his children come crashing in on him. Our kids experience us much the same way. When we walk by their Zoom, uh, even kindergartners can, can sometimes want to like sit on your lap when, they, when you're doing a Zoom call with class or when they're doing a Zoom call with class or a Google Hangout. But sometimes they're like, go away, this is school, right? And they're trying to have that separation. And that's even more true when kids get to those middle grades 
where they might even find it kind of embarrassing that their siblings or their parents are walking by. Uh, kids feel very different often about their pets, by the way. So the pet contextual collapse is like a bonus. Getting to see people's dogs and cats and hamsters is usually pretty welcome. Getting to see moms and dads and siblings is very, uh, very uneven experience for our kids. Some kids will want to turn their camera off. We're seeing a lot of high school kids uh, prefer to go through the day with more privacy. There are some pluses and minuses to that that I can talk about and challenges too for teachers uh, when more students are turning their cameras off. For younger kids, just being aware of the space that they're in and whether you're gonna be walking by, whether they need you, whether they find that embarrassing or intrusive or welcome is really helpful. It's really helpful to have those conversations with your kid. Um, we just had to have the conversation in, in our family. My son is doing most of his work in the dining room and felt really intruded on if any of us came in, even if we weren't in view of his classmates, um, but if we just came in to get a coffee or whatever. So we actually made a schedule with him, um, but we also let him know that it's all of our house and that if we need to use the bathroom, get coffee, whatever, you know, go into his space, that it's gonna happen, but that if there are certain times that he strongly prefers that we are not there, that we can at least try to not be constantly in and out of his space because he really does find it distracting. So we can talk about that. But, but the, the technical name for this I love is contextual collapse. And we are all experiencing contextual collapse. Uh, our, our colleagues at work are seeing our dogs, our pets, our spouses, our children. We're seeing their homes and all of the same cast of characters. And I hope that it will make the workplace better and more human. Uh, we're certainly learning a lot about each other. Our kids are also navigating a lot of news and I think it's really important right now. I know some of you may have stayed up to watch the debates with kids last night. Some people uh, may, may, there, may have their kids who are, if they're already out on using search or if they're using social media, they may be seeing memes about what's going on. This is an incredible time with the election all of the climate stuff going on and your, your fires in California. So much news happening, right? Black Lives Matter, um, just a tremendously intense, and of course, COVID-19 and the pandemic, right? So we're in this very intense news cycle. And many of us may not be modeling the best habits around news. So one thing to do, especially if your kids are noticing, and they may be noticing younger than you think, your first grader may be checking out your, your doom scrolling more than you notice, uh, more than you're aware that they're doing it is to talk about why we should turn off the news maybe at night. Maybe it shouldn't be the last thing we look at before we go to bed, especially if it's hurting our sleep. And really talk about and engage with our kids about the ways to consume news, how we know that the news is coming from a trusted source, and make sure, especially for our little kids, that if we are consuming news, that it's news we're comfortable with them hearing. Now, I don't advocate, you know, a full censorship approach, even with little kids. I mean, clearly everybody knows there's a pandemic. You know, toddlers know that we're washing our hands more, that we're wearing masks. So I'm not advocating that we keep those realities from kids, but rather that we choose our timing and ways of explaining things that are age appropriate so that we can have conversations with them because that will reduce their anxiety. Kids are hearing more news than we think. And even before schools closed in March, Kids were joking about COVID on the playground. They were, kids talk a lot about politics and, and they may or may not understand everything that's going on in something like a presidential or vice presidential debate, but they certainly have a lot of thoughts and they're picking up on our feelings, our anxieties, our frustrations, et cetera. So it's really important that we engage with them about that stuff. And as they're getting older, they may be also asked I know a lot of seventh and eighth graders um, in districts I work with were asked to do reports on 9-11. You don't necessarily want your eighth grader learning about 9-11 for the first time at school, right? Something like that could be kind of traumatic. So you might want to talk to them about some recent civics and, and, and world history, as well as uh, other things they may be hearing about at school. Ideally, before something like that, you would know about it, right? So, uh, but but kids, kids are bringing in a lot of questions too. So just make sure there's time to talk about what they're hearing. And if they're on TikTok or YouTube, they may be getting news in those spaces. So don't assume that just because your kid isn't reading the San Francisco Chronicle or the LA Times or listening to CNN that they're not getting news. They are getting news. We want them to use technology to connect and create and learn during this time. And as much as it may feel like technology is the bane of your existence, if your kid feels like they're turning into an iPad or, you know, sprouting a screen from their head, it may feel quite overwhelming. But I think it's important to remember how much worse this time would be if we didn't have these technological tools, if our kids had no way to connect with classmates and teachers, if we had no way to see extended family who doesn't live in our household, uh, et cetera. 
I want to talk about some of the skills that we can work on with our kids that help make them better at remote school. And I also think we have to acknowledge that there's just going to be a limit to what kids can do at certain developmental stages and certain kids, right? So self-regulation is a huge skill that school is trying to work on anyway, uh, but remote school calls for a tremendous amount of self-regulation. Focusing in school in the classroom is hard. Focusing at home when the fridge is full of snacks, the playroom is full of Legos, um, siblings may be there doing their work at a, a, in a different grade, uh, parents may be there trying to work. It's very distracting. And so self-regulation is especially resisting the siren call of the Legos, resisting the urge to go get a snack, showing up to the next thing. We can support our kids in self-regulation, but we also have to have age-appropriate expectations. Um, you know, most kindergartners, if given a device that has a lot of fun things to do, um, will need some help focusing and staying on task if, if they don't know where to go, if they have too many choices. Um, sometimes if we can get a printout, if the school can get you uh, a printed workbook, or if you can get, a print, get access to a printer, um, I know the libraries in some places are also allowing people to print things. If you can get certain, um, some of the things that you, school materials that your child is expected to use in a paper copy, that may be, be may be helpful if your child is struggling to self-regulate. And this is especially for the kids who are going off the rails with things like YouTube or gaming. Uh, there also may be some simple ways to keep your child in the activity, partly letting them know that the teacher can see if they're going out, partly giving them a, a, an actually a focused period of time to work. For some kids, that could be as short as five to 10 minutes. Like, hey, we're going to do this math thing for 10 minutes, really focused, go, set a timer, and really keep them on task for those 10 minutes, and then maybe they get to take a break. Ideally, to reward self-regulation, we don't take a break by doing the thing that challenges self-regulation, so we don't want to immediately then go to YouTube as that break, but maybe we use exercise or, um, you know, a drink of water or just a stretch break, right, to reward that self-regulation. And also to recognize, again, that some kids are going to struggle with this more than others. There are kids who are very regulated at seven, eight, nine years old, and other kids who at 14, 15 are still struggling with self-regulation. That sense of time is another thing that a lot of us uh, struggle with in a remote environment because we don't have a lot of the external time cues. School does this really well for kids, whether there's bells going off in middle school and high school, in elementary school, uh, you know, you know, great teachers just have such a strong routine. You don't even know what's happening. Now it's circle time. Now it's snack time. Now it's time to go to art and music and the kids really know the drill. At home, Building routines will also help you, whether it's let's all exercise, whether it's a dance party around the table before we sit down to do school, a run or a bike ride around the block. Uh, anything you can do with exercise before the first part of especially a synchronous remote school day um, or any seated, seated work, whether it's synchronous or asynchronous, anytime you can do start with exercise, it's going to help. And also building that routine is going to help with that sense of time. Getting dressed is also important. Now, I'm definitely... Um, not here to be punitive with kids who do show up in PJs. That's not my, my jam. I, I, I certainly think we, we don't want to penalize kids for things. Uh, but that said, the ritual of getting dressed in the morning, putting on a shirt, taking off the pajama shirt, putting on a daytime shirt, um, eating some breakfast, all of that helps have a time sense. And then as kids get older, do you want them to wear a watch? Do you want to set the timer on the microwave? What's going to work? If they have that Zoom at 112 that they have to go to and you have a call from 1 to 2, how are they going to know to get there? And part of that is trying different things with your kids to see what works. Part of that, again, like I referenced uh, my friend who's the solo mom with a really intense job and the, the kid with the 504, is also knowing what's not working because they were trying to get him to do everything on his own. Uh, and she did try to flex her job and none of that really worked. And then the next step was to change some things with school, right? So they tried other things. It may be that your kids do really well with a printed schedule where you write on like a whiteboard or blackboard for the day. Sometimes having them write that out, if you have a kid who's already writing and can write pretty fluently, you know, maybe a second or third grader or up and can really write that schedule out for themselves, the process of writing it down and focusing on, okay, at nine o'clock, we're gonna do math. At 10 o'clock, we're gonna take a break and play in the backyard. At 10.30, I have my Zoom meeting with my language arts teacher, or that's when I read out loud with the reading specialist. Right? Writing all of that down may help. If that's too onerous, that's fine. You can write it down. 
Um, visual schedules are great for young kids, even for early readers, uh, just you know, with, with pictures of what they're gonna do throughout the day. You can use stickers to make those. There's a couple of apps that help you make uh, visual schedules as well. Time and routine is really challenging even for high school kids, but they certainly should be taking responsibility. Um, you know, your eighth grader, your high schooler should be setting alarms for themselves. They should have a digital calendar, but I wouldn't assume that they know how. If you have a kid who has struggled with executive function or keeping track of time, I wouldn't, I wouldn't assume that they know how to have a digital calendar. I wouldn't assume that they know how to work backward from a deadline. Uh, one story from my home is my son made the transition from K-5 with one teacher all day to sixth grade this year, and there are multiple teachers throughout the day, and he did not know that he wasn't supposed to do all the work for in class, right? Like he would start doing the work, they would tell him to do it. He was like, great, I'm gonna do this work. And then I would walk by and say, oh, aren't you supposed to go to your next class? And he was like, but I have to finish the work from this class. And I said, no, no, you have to go to the next class. Like, look, there's a schedule here. This is, you know, it's 2.11, it's time for period seven. And his mind was kind of blown because uh, he, never, he never got finished with fifth grade, right? And he never got an orientation to middle school. He was sort of, you know, dropped from planet grade five with one teacher all day to planet online middle school. So if you have a kid in that situation, you may need to explain to them, hey, you're maybe not supposed to do all the work in the moment that it's given. Some of it is supposed to be for later and you have to write it down. Uh, so even just for me figuring out that we needed to help him set up an assignment notebook, that he needed to write down the work, that's really huge. Navigating distraction, right? Headphones are incredibly helpful. If there's something that you can get from the community, um, if the school has given you a Chromebook or an iPad, but they haven't given you headphones, you may want to ask for those or see if you can get them. It really helps, especially if you have siblings working in the same room or parents and kids working in the same room. Now, you may want to be able to hear your kid in class, especially if you have a kid who has had trouble staying on task or has gone off task, because if they're watching YouTube videos and they're not on headphones, that might be a way that you would know that's happening and you could kind of poke your head in and say what's going on. On the other hand, if you have multiple kids working in the same room, headphones are really going to help tremendously. The other thing is asking your child what distracts him or her, like, like we did in my home, and I've talked to other families who have done this, and then make a plan for the most focused possible environment. The reality is kids are going to get distracted through the day and getting breaks to do physical activity, to drink water, stay hydrated, to have snacks is really important. So I would expect a certain amount of distraction. And again, look at periods of focused work potentially as quite short. Maybe for a young child, 10 to 15 minutes might be the most focused work at one time, and then they're gonna need a break. Uh, for older kids, it might be a little bit longer, but I would not expect anyone, um, even a high school or college student to simply sit down at eight in the morning and just kind of go through school all day without a break, without getting distracted, without going off task. And the good news is we don't necessarily need to minute for minute reflect the school day. Because remember, a ton of your kid's school day is lunch, hanging out with other kids, walking to the specials, um, getting organized physically, right? And some of that time isn't needed, right? Your child doesn't need to change their clothes uh, for gym at home and to change their clothes, uh, you know, to put on clothes for recess, right? So all of that, that time is eliminated. Uh, and I think it's really important that we don't expect remote school, even the synchronous parts, to look exactly like a, a physical school day. Getting our kids involved in giving back in the community, even if it's just hanging a sign like this in your window, chalking up the sidewalk with positive messages for neighbors, anything we can do, checking in with extended family or a member of your religious community or neighborhood community who may be elderly and isolated right now, Anything we can do to help our kids feel like they're helping and to actually make a difference can help our kids actually regain some of their sense of autonomy and their sense of purpose that this pandemic has stripped from so many of us because we don't have uh, that sense that we're effective in the world. Some of us maybe have that because we're getting out there and we're able to do our jobs, but for a lot of us, the feeling of just helping a neighbor um, or helping in the community has been really diminished. And this is such an important time. Um, it can feel like a really divisive time, but the more we do to help our kids stay positive, and again, that doesn't have to involve contact, right? There's a lot of contactless ways to give food 
There are contactless ways to, um, to do all kinds of things for people, including checking in again with people who may be isolated during this time. If you have an older child, maybe they can be reading to a younger child via Zoom or helping that younger child practice reading. Maybe they can be connecting by writing letters to people. Right, but anything we can do to help our kids feel like they're, they're actually effective and also that they have autonomy. Any choices we can give our kids are also important right now. So if there is an opportunity for a choice of what to read, for example, or what, uh, what to write a nonfiction report about, we wanna embrace those choices with our kids as much as possible. So even letting the teacher know if you're having trouble getting your child to read, is there a preferred topic that you think would really motivate your child if they had reading material on that topic or uh, in that genre? This is a time to give kids some choices because so many choices have been taken away. We also wanna make sure our kids are doing some analog work or non-digital work, whether it's just drawing with pencils and crayons, uh, for older kids, maybe it's doing some creative photography, but with a camera that's not necessarily an iPhone uh, or a, an iPad, right, or another tablet. Maybe it's doing a, just a, a walk, an, ob an observing walk in the neighborhood. I talked to a science teacher sending kids out to observe nature signs right now. Anything we can do to take some of that time that's in front of the screen and do something else that changes the way our body and our mind are working together. So the tech I believe is incredibly helpful. Thank goodness we have it. This would be much worse if we didn't, but it's really great to take a break. And again, if you know your child is struggling uh, with the amount of screen time, either because of physical symptoms or just your sense that they're very, getting very distracted, um, or if they're getting headaches or eye strain, you can ask the teacher, is there something they can do um, that fulfills this assignment or is learning in this area, but maybe as an unplugged activity, like a, again, a drawing, writing by hand. Uh, I was able, my son's handwriting isn't great, so most of his writing is on the keyboard, but sometimes I'll have him write something by hand and just I'll take a picture on my phone and send it to the teacher, right? Or actually now I'm sending it, now that he's in sixth grade, in fifth grade I did that, but in sixth grade I want him to email the teacher, so I'm sending it to him and he's emailing it to the teacher. Uh, but it's really important that we teach our kids how to do this stuff. We also do need to teach them to self-advocate. Uh, if there's a problem in the grade book, if you're, one of your kids' assignments is showing up missing, if they're in middle school, if they're in high school, they should be checking in with the teacher. This is definitely not the time to let kids flounder, though. So if, you, if they're checking in with a teacher and they say they haven't heard back, or if you're struggling to know what's going on, it's fine for parents to check in. Usually with kids you know, 12 and up, I would say it's more important for the child to learn to advocate for themselves. But with the challenges of remote school, I do think this is a unique time where if you're worried about your kids, especially if, they're, if they seem to be struggling in a subject area, certainly encourage them to self-advocate and reach out to the teacher, but it's also not a bad idea for you to check in and let them know, even to say, I know my kid reached out to you. I just want you to know that I'm thinking about how to support him or her at home. Please feel free to reach out to me or talk to me if you think that would be helpful or if you want me to get involved, right? Just signaling to the teacher that you're aware that there may be an issue is, is, could be important right now. Uh, that said, we do want our kids to have that responsibility. Many of our kids are getting a lot of email for the first time in their lives. When I closed out my fifth graders Chromebook last year, I found 600 unanswered emails uh, from May, to May and June. Uh, that's a lot of email for a 10-year-old. So if your school is emailing you a lot, you may want to sit down with your child once a day and look at those emails uh, and make sure that they understand that they're kind of expected to look at that potentially. Um, a lot of those emails may be actually videos of the teacher talking through some of the things your child's supposed to do. Some of it also may be re repetitive, like if they go into the learning management system, they may get the information that the emails are also conveying. So we're also getting a lot of email overload there. But we don't want to leave, you know, a third or fourth grader or fifth grader with 600 unanswered emails. Um, that's not ideal. So, I do, you know, we should be looking at that with them. This is a great time to teach our kids some skills around the house, whether it's how to bake macaroni and cheese, how to fix the car, anything we can work on that's pragmatic right now. It's great quality time with our kids. It might save you money. Maybe your kid will get really good and you know, change your oil for you next time. Maybe your kid can make dinner once a week. Um, we want our kids to pitch in and we want to acknowledge how much we appreciate that they're pitching in because we are all very stretched right now. Kids feel great when they do chores that actually help around the house, whether it's unloading the dishwasher and you let them know how much that helps or making breakfast for a sibling or 
fixing something, they feel really good. So we obviously don't want to overburden our kids, but we do want them to help and they actually feel more effective. A lot of them have a lot of time on their hands right now. Um, and it's okay for us to fill some of that, not with busy work, but useful labor around the house. We want our kids to be getting their sleep. This is so crucial. We need to model, again, I talked about with the news cycle, not looking at news that's stressful right before bed, um, but we need to model sleep hygiene in general. And especially if kids are doing their remote schoolwork in their bedrooms, which I know may be the best uh, situation for some kids because they may, they may actually need to be in a room that's more private and quiet during this, the day if there are multiple people doing work in the home. But I would get that device out of their room at night and make sure that they have a plan for going to sleep and make sure that they have some closing rituals. Again, especially if your bedroom is also your essentially your office, which is happening for a lot of middle schoolers and high schoolers and maybe also your gaming den. Um, you wanna make sure that there's some kind of ritual where you turn that room back into uh, a sleeping space and also where you maybe take some time out of the room right? So if your teenager's room is starting to smell a little funky, you know, open a window, maybe they need to change their sheets. Um, if they are in bed doing their work, that is not ideal, again, for posture, etc. Now, I know some kids are anxious and they're kind of retreating to their bed for part of the day. Um, if that's where your kid is at and they're showing up for school, you're still doing the best you can. You are a great parent right away. I want to be really clear. Everyone listening, you're an amazing caregiver. You are showing up for your kids. This is an incredibly stressful time. If you can get your kids to not do their work in bed, it's going to be better for their posture and their sleep. It's going to be better for their focus. And they're going to be probably more comfortable turning on the camera if they're not like lounging in with their, you know, stuffed animals and stuff. During this time, we can use tech to stay in touch with family. This is my family boggle night with my mother-in-law. She's 90 years old. We were not seeing her in person through much of the winter. Now we're seeing her only outdoors, which means in Chicago, it's going to get very cold soon. We may go back to just digital only. Um, we're playing boggle with her every night. I cannot tell you how good we all are at boggle now. None of us were particularly good to start. Uh, but it turns out when you practice a skill, you get much better at it. So um, I just want to advocate for using digital means, whether it's Zoom calls, games, uh, anything that keeps you in touch with family and friends during this time and getting your kids involved with maybe making some choices around what those activities are. Physical activity is crucial. We need to be doing exercise with our kids, whether it's a dance party, push-up contest, Biking around the block, I know that you've had many days in recent weeks where the air quality wasn't great and you were maybe having to adapt to doing indoor exercise. Certainly the days where the air is good, I would try to get outside. Um, you may find that you can even do some work outside. For some kids, uh, being outside can be an effective place to do some of their school, whether it's synchronous or asynchronous work. For other kids, it doesn't work. Um, but every day that we can get a little bit of sunlight on our faces, any day that we can get some movement in, these are really crucial, both for our physical and our mental health. I already talked a little bit about routines. Uh, routines can also reduce power struggles with kids. If you know that every day at eight o'clock, we're gonna run around the block before school starts, then it's gonna be harder to resist. Uh, whereas if it's a surprise and one day dad wakes you up and says, we're gonna run around the block, the kids are gonna be like, what? No, I lie in bed at this time, or I do you know, my classwork in bed. So. Uh, at least for many kids, it's best not to surprise them, uh, but to make a routine to write it down and let them anticipate and plan and get used to it. So again, some, some of us have like cute Pinterest worthy schedules here. I'm going to move to Q&A in just a moment, but I just want to have full disclosure and say this is what our, you know, home learning environment looks like much of the time. It does not look Pinterest worthy. It looks kind of messy, uh, but every day we, you know, clean up and start again. <laughs> Uh, what can I say? Sometimes we're outside, sometimes we're inside, but we always, uh, we always have a plan. And then we look at the end of the day and talk about what we did well. I think it's really easy to talk about what went wrong. You know, the Zoom meeting you missed or the frustration you had where, you know, a password changed or there was some other tech issue. And those are real frustrations. And I have had many of them myself. And uh, I think, you know, we, we know that this is really hard and that nothing, that there's no perfect design. Uh, for remote school, we, we just weren't, you know, as a society ready to move to full remote school. And, and it's much better now than it was in the spring, but it's still a work in progress for all of us. Uh, but we're doing it, right? So try to think of one thing that went well today that you can praise your kids for at dinner that you can talk about as a family and try not to focus always on what's going wrong. 
Um, if a lot of things are going wrong, definitely let school know, of course. Okay, I want to move quickly to Q&A. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about screen time in general, because I know that the organizers of this event shared with me that there are families that are just worried about screen time in general, and our kids are obviously using tech a ton. So I do want to talk about the different ways kids use tech. If kids are watching a cooking show and they get inspired to make their own cooking show or do their own cooking, if they are connecting with friends via Zoom, via texting, via TikTok, via WhatsApp, you know, those are all discrete experiences, connecting with others, learning from content, creating content and sharing it. So rather than lump all of the ways they're using tech into this big behemoth of screen time, I think it's more effective to think about the different ways we're using tech and what role it's playing. Is it helping your child stay in touch with friends or family? Is it helping your child be inspired? Is it helping your child connect with music or art, right? Is it kind of mindless entertainment, which there's a place for that, especially in a pandemic, to be distracted from what's going on, to have some levity and lightness? Um, on the other hand, if you feel like your child is kind of mindlessly scrolling, if they're playing a game or consuming content that you don't like, if they're just consuming so much that it is interfering with sleep or face-to-face -face time with family or chores they need to do or school, then that's when it becomes a challenge or a problem and you want to look at redirecting some of that time into another activity. But I think it's really important, especially since most of our lives are really mediated by tech now, that we don't lump everything into this kind of vortex of screen time and, and generalize and call it all the same thing. I would love to take some questions now, and I'm also gonna put uh, this little image on the screen that has my, if you wanna like follow me on Twitter, or, and I just got this, this is like this cool new thing that you can text the word tech in all caps to 66866 and get on my mailing list, and then I'll mail you useful tips about remote school and all kinds of things. But let me open up the Q&A, because I see some folks here. How do we thank the virtual teachers for their efforts? We would normally bake cookies or a small gift card for the holidays. How are you so nice to even think about the teachers right now um, during this stressful time? I am sure um, that even just a thank you, you know, an email thank you, my, uh, one of my son's teachers helped him solve a problem and I quietly thanked her for letting him solve it on his own. Um, just with an email, and she said, it's so nice to hear something nice from parents because 90% of my email right now is like, the Zoom link's not working, oh my gosh, or, you know, um, my kid is having this problem or that problem, and of course she's happy to respond to those, but it was just so nice for her to get a positive email from a parent saying, hey, I really appreciate how you've, um, you know, my, my son has really grown a lot in your, she's his advisor, so in, in her, in your advisory, and it's just so nice to hear something positive, and I'm really enjoying having him in, in my class. It was like a great interaction. Of course, uh, you know, if you want to find a way to safely give a teacher a gift through the PTA or through the, your grade level committee, I think that gifting right now is really tricky. I think people are, you know, it's complicated how to even do it safely, but I would say even just a warm note or a you know, better yet, if your child wants to write their teacher a note for like teacher appreciation day or, you know, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily force this, but, you know, remind them on Thanksgiving, for example, like, think about what are you thankful for? Oh, you, you're thankful for your favorite teacher? Like, write them a note, you know, like your child's note in crayon or pen is going to be really meaningful to the teacher. Um, I'm not saying Starbucks gift cards are like out of the question, by the way. I'm sure your teacher would like that too, but I really think those heartfelt notes mean a lot. Do you think it would help my child focus to go for a walk in the morning before virtual class? Absolutely. 100%. And again, I don't know what the safety level for your family is, but even for some families, I'm seeing people walk to their school and they're getting to say hi to other families, maybe from a distance with masks on. If you can bike around the block a few times or go a little further. One thing I have learned again with my own sixth grader is that his capacity for exercise is actually greater than mine and he needs more than me. The whole adult pattern of like work out hard in the gym for an hour and then be sedentary for eight hours is not enough. He needs that hard hour long workout sedentary for a couple hours and then he needs at least another 20, 30, 40 minutes. 
And then maybe another, think about what kids would usually do. They're biking to school, they're going to soccer practice, they have PE at school. Some of their schools are big and open and they're walking, you know, if you, if you have a kid in high school or middle school, they might be walking from end to end of the building and running up six flights of stairs. So try to like get that in there, <laughs> truly. Um, and, and, and see if you can get your kid excited about different challenges. Uh, so definitely going for a walk to start the school day is a great ritual. And especially if you can, maybe some of us have time shifted our work. I know I do a lot of work from 6 a.m. to 8 a.m. before my son wakes up. If you can time shift any of your work and then get them up, go for that walk, then you've already gotten a couple of hours work done. Maybe you can take that time with them. So I know not everyone has that kind of flexibility and then I'm extraordinarily lucky that I do. But if you do have that, that might work. Um, okay, can you talk about special considerations for high schoolers? Uh, my son who just turned 15 is an only child. I worry about the lack of social interaction. He does his homework, but I still worry he spends too much time on Xbox. Well, probably if he's on Xbox, he's also talking on an app like Discord. And that's actually a great way for kids to keep in touch right now. So I wanna talk a little bit about gaming. Actually, I meant to talk more about it in my main talk, but I wanted to really make sure we had enough time for Q&A. Here's the thing, kids don't have a lot to talk about right now. Some kids are very political. They're gonna be talking about Black Lives Matter and climate change. But a lot of kids are like, what am I talking about? You know, your third grader would usually be talking about what they saw at recess. Your 15 year old would be like comparing notes of like that crazy thing that happened in math or what's going on interpersonally or who just broke up with who, or maybe talking about a movie that's coming out. A lot of our kids are kind of strapped for conversation topics. And even as adults in our friendships, a lot of us are like, wow, what do we talk about, you know? <laughs> Um, my husband and I usually have great conversations, but he just asked me to come chat with him while he was making dinner the other night. And I was like, okay, but I got no news for you, bud. <laughs> like, <laughs> love you, but like we've been together a lot these last six months. There's not a lot of updates. So games are like a really great way for kids to relate. And for our kids who are missing sports and some of these other things, they're also a way to get out some of that competitive stuff that they would usually get out maybe on the playing field. So uh, not to say, I, I if you have a kid who's really into gaming, what, not to say no limits at all, right? I would really look at how is it in, uh, affecting their sleep, for example. I wouldn't want a 15-year-old to do Xbox, you know, after you go to bed and be on there from like 1 a.m. to 5 a.m. and you don't know. that Those are the kids that are turning into vampires. Sometimes our teenagers are flipping their sleep-wake cycle because it's natural for them to be up later, but they're also doing it to get space from us because as much as we don't love being cooped up with our kids um, for six months, they really don't. Teenagers are, were not designed to be home with their parents for months like this and they want that space and some of them are trying to get it by you know sleeping in the day and being up at night but that's not a great schedule to maintain for school so I would definitely look at the relationship between gaming and sleep and gaming and mood um, and make sure that it's not hurting the relationships that he's in in any way but if it seems to be supporting the relationships and he's balancing it with some physical activity and getting his schoolwork done I would see it as a positive and I would even ask him too like how do you see this what's the role of this in your life you know and really observe his mood and how he's doing. Um, it's absolutely okay for a 15 year old to have other responsibilities at home. You know, if, if he's like gaming, but he's not putting away his dishes, if he's not making dinner, if he's not cleaning the house at all, cleaning his room, you can certainly, you know, put in some minimum expectations there because um, you're setting him up also for independence in a life where he'll be in a dorm in a couple of years or living on his own. And you want him to be able to self-regulate. Here's another question. Now that I'm more involved in my sixth graders learning, I feel like I'm putting more pressure on him. I'm so glad you mentioned this because I think a lot of us are like, oh my gosh, my kid never talks in class or I'm hearing the teacher and I think the teacher maybe doesn't like my kid. I heard something in their tone. A lot of us are getting like reciprocal school trauma from just being in our kid's classroom and being able to um, hear that. So this parent goes on to say, how can I balance that better? I'm constantly nagging to get him on task and studying for tests. For tests he, and he's saying things like, mom, I always have tests. It's not like this is my entire grade. Well, and especially in these early middle school years, kids are really testing their independence. It is a time where a lot of kids are going to see what happens if they, you know, try to, um, you know, not work as hard on particular things or if they work really hard on some things at the last minute. And I think adding remote school to that mix is really challenging. And, and I think you're so wise to notice that because you're, you're there, you're maybe putting more pressure just by your own anxiety. And kids at that age are developmentally wired to kind of push you away. So I would say, unless there's a severe problem, you could say very directly to your kid, look, I'm having a hard time separating myself from my worries about 
what you're getting done, but as long as you're getting it done, I'm going to really work on separating myself. If you start missing assignments, missing synchronous Zooms, you know, bombing tests, then I'm going to feel like I need to get more involved. So here's how you can keep me out of your hair is show me that you're doing it well. Show me that you've, you're keeping an assignment notebook. Show me that you're, you know, doing what you need to do. And then when I have parent teacher conferences, which are probably coming right up, I'll, you know, I'll have a chance to learn more about what you're doing. But you can also say, I really respect that you as a sixth grader, you're in middle school now, I know you've got this, and I'm going to work hard to respect that boundary with you. And just maybe we'll check in like once a week about school and not every couple hours. Um, and I think that's a very respectful thing for you to say and to recognize that part of it is that you're just there. Um, and hearing more about it. So, okay, I'm going to, there were some questions that came in beforehand that I want to look at. And Deborah, I can chime in here. Yeah, do you want to read those questions? Because there are a couple that came in that I think other people might be interested in. You bet. Here's one that I know is on everybody's mind. I know that I can set rules about screen time for my kids, but how can I encourage them to self-regulate? I have enough trouble regulating my own screen time. I, that's a great question and we all are having trouble and truly my kid will call me out on my ability to self-regulate and say, didn't you say no news right before bed or, you know, why are, why are you scrolling again? You know, you said you weren't going to scroll or why are you on Twitter right now? We're, I'm trying to talk to you, right? So definitely acknowledging that you're struggling with it. Ask them if there's one tech habit you both want to change, ask them what their least favorite tech habit of yours is. Maybe it's texting while you're talking to them. Um, or maybe it's something else that you do and what, what, and you can tell them maybe one thing you would like them to change. And maybe you take a weekly challenge and say like, let's really try it this week. Um, again, this approach isn't going to work for every family. If you, if you're the kind of family that would have a swear jar, this could totally work for you. If you're a kind of family where you're like, my kid would never say a bad word. I can't believe you would suggest that. Then maybe this is not the approach for you. So really you have to look at what kind of parenting you do and what, what, what feels appropriate and fun, but having a shared challenge of, let's see if we can all, you know, stay off a certain kind of device at a certain time and making sure that everyone's on board and that it feels like your child is actually opting in with you um, and that they see the benefit from it, that it's not this external, like, we're just going to unplug to unplug or I'm trying, I'm punishing you or you're in trouble, but more like I see us all getting really stressed out when we try to watch a fun show together, but we're also all on our phones. So maybe we put the phones in another room and we actually just go and watch our shared family show that we love together. And we keep, we keep each other honest about it. We're all allowed to kind of point out, hey, remember you weren't gonna bring your phone in with you. Or remember it's some other thing that we're trying to do less of. Or, and the other thing is catch your kid doing the right thing. So when they transition from their game to dinner and they're really friendly about it, remind, you know, say that was a really great transition. You know, I reminded you to come to dinner and you were, you used a really friendly tone of voice and you said five more minutes and then you really wrapped up in five minutes. And that really helps me trust you to know that you can game before dinner and that I'll still see you at dinner and dinner won't get cold and, you know, you won't be not here to set the table or whatever your responsibilities are. So we do have to remember, especially during this time when, frankly, our kids may be driving us nuts through no fault of their own, but just truly overexposure right now. Um, and some of the behaviors that, they're, that, that we're finding challenging are probably stress and anxiety related too. So we want to be especially empathetic during this incredibly stressful time. That said, they may be driving us a little you know, nuts right now. And so we have to kind of remember to compliment them when they do the right thing. You know, I just want to reiterate what Devorah has been emphasizing today because it's so important. And that is talking to your kids, talking to your kids about the limits. You don't have to be the one to set all the limits. You should be doing it together with your children. And I often share her advice, which is that you really need to make sure that you let your kids know if you're gonna be doing anything like monitoring their phone, monitoring their screen use, because if you don't and something happens, then how do you talk to them? So again, thank you, Deborah, for that emphasis on respect and mutual communication. It's really important. One more question and then we'll go to a final comment, okay? Uh, this is a question that a lot of parents have asked us. I'm worried about the long-term impact of distance learning on my kids. How will they be able to attend regular school after all this time remotely? Some kids even seem to prefer it. Well, I think for kids who prefer 
some aspects of remote school. And there are kids who prefer some aspects. I've met very few kids who prefer the entire sort of the whole thing and really love the full experience. But there are kids, for example, who really love some of the asynchronous aspects. Kids who maybe have slower processing. And there are a lot of very, very bright kids who are slow processors who really benefit from being able to slow down the lecture and stop it at different points to take notes, for example. Um, and might do really well using some of those techniques in, in high school and college. That's actually great information. You have other kids who the class participation is easier because they're less anxious um, at home for some reasons, um, which, you know, we could talk about why that might be. Um, or it feels easier to participate uh, because it's a little bit easier to anticipate your turn. It feels less stressful. You know, in the, in the regular classroom, kids, some kids get real nervous about getting called on. But in a Zoom classroom, sometimes teachers are maybe making smaller breakout groups and doing things to reduce the scale, which is ideal. And that may reduce anxiety for some kids. So just noticing that and then thinking about what can I do with that information, right? Hopefully most of our kids will be back in a physical school building. You know, I'm ready for mine to be back. It's not gonna happen where I live anytime soon. Um, but getting used to bells, getting used to being in the noisy hallway is gonna be challenging for a lot of kids. So they're going to be okay. I've seen kids make this transition back now in some places and they do get through it. We had, I've seen some kids go through school refusal and anxiety for the first couple of days, but then they usually get through it pretty quickly. Um, there are definitely therapists in every community who can help if you do have a kid who, you know, refuses school. So I don't want to borrow trouble. Your kids will probably be fine. They'll probably go back to school and it's going to be okay. But you can get professional help from the school district and from, and privately, if that becomes a problem. Uh, but I would also say, what did you learn about yourself? Are you a kid who's going to do, or a young a student who's going to do really well at a liberal arts college and you need to be sitting around a table with people? Or could you maybe go to a huge school and do really well with recorded lectures and flip what call, what's called flipped learning when you watch the lecture later and do more of the lab part in school? <laughs> so learning about who you are as a learner, I would see that as a gift. And I, I am experiencing mostly the downsides of remote school at my home, but I will say for my hyper-focused ADHD kid, I am seeing some upside. And one of the upsides is I can give him a lot longer on the days we're doing asynchronous work. I can, if he wants to finish a book and read for 90 minutes instead of 42 minutes, we can do that. Well, what might that look like? Eventually, he's not gonna be in the regimented world of you know, K-12 education. So that's really good information for him to have about himself as a learner. It's also good for me to realize that in addition to taking away the iPad at night, there are really high interest books about how to create D&D &D characters that also have to go at night. So he doesn't stay up all night creating new non-player characters. We learned that last week, right? So most parents are like, here's more books. I'm like, I'm taking away the books, go to bed. <laughs> right? But, but it's really important also to find out what we can do to help our kids keep their friendships going right now. And so I wanna close actually with, with that and just a note for parents about self-care. So, Helping our kids keep up with at least one peer, um, truly for our little kids, for our pre-Kers and kindergartners, you're still their most important people. It would be lovely if they were playing with friends, but they will get that back when they go back to school and they may not enjoy the online socializing very much. Some kids do, um, but a two, five and six year olds who might be able to play for three hours in person might only be able to engage on Zoom for 20 minutes. So it's really important to keep those expectations realistic. Your kid is probably not gonna have a three hour play date on Zoom. Um, and if they do, it might have to be more like parallel play, like I'm doing dress up at my house, you're doing dress up at your house, here's all the face paint, now we're doing face paint together, right, or something, but it's not going to be just like, hey, what's up, and then they're just going to talk for hours, and um, that's probably not going to happen. For high school kids, we're seeing kids do FaceTime, and they're like parallel doing their homework together. Um, we have to remember that teenagers love to hang out. They're not necessarily engaging in like, you know, again, hours of reciprocal conversation that's just like an intense talk. They may do that, but they may also just hang out. And so if they take that hangout to literally Google Hangouts or, you know, Zoom or FaceTime, that's still great. They're still observing each other. They're still, you know, it's still positive. So we, what we want to do for kids who are struggling with keeping up here, especially for grade school and middle school and high school kids, if they're saying they're lonely, not if you think they're isolated, but if they're saying they're lonely or you can see that they're really lonely, and maybe when school closed, they were kind of in between peer groups and they're kind of stuck in that spot right now because it's hard to make new friends in a pandemic. What can you do to plug them into a virtual activity? Are school doing any virtual clubs? Your local libraries, I know, are doing some, some virtual meetups for you know tweens and teens games, anime nights. 
right? What can you do to, to help them find one thing to connect with? So it may be hard, teens often resist their parents' suggestions, um, but you can give them a menu of options and say, choose one of these things. Uh, but we do want kids to have some peer interaction. That said, again, we should also be looking at them and not assuming that they're lonely. If they have one friend that they're talking to and maybe your experience in high school is you had 20 friends, don't put that on them. And I want to close with a really important reminder that we all take care of ourselves during this time. If you need to call a friend and cry in the car, if you need to use that telehealth visit with a therapist yourself, right? Maybe it's not your kid who needs to talk to someone, maybe you do. Parents are under tremendous strain right now. And I'm talking to a lot of families where the kids are doing okay. They may not be like as happy as they've ever been during this time, but they're like holding up okay. And the parents are carrying incredible stress, not sleeping at night, having tons of conflict, very worried about their kids and feeling like a failure as parents. This is a time that's testing us all as parents because our kids are going through an adverse experience that we cannot fix for them and we feel powerless. So it's very important that you acknowledge that you're doing a good job, that you are keeping your kids safe, that you're doing the best you can, and that you matter too. And you take, take that time to go for a walk yourself. Take that time to go for a bike ride. Take that time to you know, eat your favorite cookie or call your favorite friend. And if your kid is getting some screen time while you do that and that allows you to keep going, that's okay too. So that's what I want to leave you with, because we know if the mothership or the fathership goes down, the whole family's in trouble. So take care of yourself. Thank you so much. And again, you can come find me on Twitter. You can text tech to this, this number, 66866. Um, and I'll send you emails and just keep on keeping on. This is a very challenging time. And I hope you stay safe and that we all get through this together. Thank you so much, Dr. Heitner, for your wonderful presentation today. And everybody, I will follow up with an email tomorrow with her contact information, a lot of information to absorb. So do look for the video that we will have coming up. Again, thank you, thank you, Deborah, for a wonderful information-rich presentation. Take care, everybody. See you soon. Mm -hmm.